35 years ago today, on the 3rd of October 1981, I was just beginning my 55th day of hunger strike in the prison hospital in Long Cash. Uh, the 3rd of October 1981 was the day the hunger strike uh, ended. Uh, at that stage, I was critically ill. Uh, I weighed about seven and a half stone. I was almost totally blind, uh, completely yellow with jaundice. And I had been told by a consultant from the city hospital in Belfast four days previously that even if I ended my hunger strike there and then, uh, I might not survive. So uh, I was very weak. I, I couldn't move from the bed. Uh, and I reckon I had between 48 and 72 hours to live. And I had been told the previous night that the hunger strike was going to end at 3 o'clock on the 3rd of October, which was a Saturday. Uh, so my first uh, emotion was relief that I was going to survive. Uh, however, uh, it was tinged with a lot of sadness uh, about the 10 men who had died and uh, wondering how their families would feel with the ending of the hunger strike. Uh, and did they think that the sacrifices of their sons or brothers or husbands uh, would have been a waste. So uh, there were mixed emotions uh, with the ending of the hunger strike. I had had a meeting with Bick McFarland uh, on the Friday night, uh, and he told me that all the hunger strikers uh, would be brought to the hospital for a meeting the following day at two o'clock. Um, myself and Jackie McMullen were in the hospital, but the other hunger strikers were still in the blocks. So uh, at around two o'clock, everyone arrived up along with Beck. Normally when we had meetings in the hospital, uh, they would take place in the canteen. However, as I was too weak to go to a meeting in the canteen, the meeting was held in my cell, uh, a small a small cell, and there were uh, seven or eight people uh, in that cell, uh, many of them actually smoking, so the cell was filled with smoke, uh, and we discussed how we would uh, uh, end the hunger strike, and it was decided that at 3 p.m. I would call in the senior medical officer in the hospital, and tell him that I was terminating my hunger strike, and that would signal the end of the hunger strike that had been that had begun on the first of March that year, uh, and led to the deaths of ten of our comrades in the H blocks. I was arrested in 1978, uh, picked out on an identification parade, and charged with causing an explosion at a commercial premises in Belfast city centre. Uh, and was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. When I was arrested, I was 19, uh, and just short of 20 when I was sentenced. Uh, so I immediately joined the blanket protest when, when I arrived in the H blocks. And by the time the hunger strike came around, I was 23. I didn't know all the hunger strikers. Uh, I had met Frank Hughes, I knew Kieran Doherty, I had been in H4 with him. Uh, I knew Tom McElwee quite well, uh, we had been in H3 together. And I knew Kevin Lynch. And of course I knew Bobby, I had been in H3 with Bobby. Uh, and had spoken to him on occasion on Sundays at Mass. Uh, other than that, I didn't know the rest of the hunger strikers at all. Um, I wouldn't say any of them were close friends of mine, but uh, in the situation that we were in, on the blanket, there was a sense of comradeship or esprit de corps that you don't get anywhere else, and I've never experienced anywhere else. People were very close, it was almost like a family. So when comrades died, even though you may not have known them or may not have known them well, uh, there was a great sense of sadness and a great sense of loss uh, as each death took place. Well, the reason the hunger strike was called off is quite simple. The, the rationale behind hunger striking is to bring uh, political and moral pressure on your political opponent 
uh, and all the focus should be on that opponent. Uh, so when men or women uh, go on hunger strike, the whole idea is to shine a light on the injustice that has been inflicted on them uh, and to bring moral pressure to bear on that political opponent. And what happened uh, towards the end of the hunger strike was that the legal position was that if a hunger striker lapsed into unconsciousness, their next of kin could order medical intervention. And that's what happened. Uh, when Paddy Quinn lap lapsed into unconsciousness, his mother ordered medical intervention. So the balance then shifted. The pressure began to bear down on the families. The media were camped outside their houses. The church and other political parties were putting pressure on the families, asking them were they going to intervene or were they going to allow uh, their son to die. Uh, and the first intervention was then followed by another and another. And we had a number of meetings to discuss how we could get over this obstacle. And we came to the conclusion that we couldn't. Uh, the balance had shifted, the focus and the spotlight, instead of being on our political opponents, had shifted on to the families. Uh, and that was what brought the hunger strike to an end. Uh, it took me quite a while to recover after the ending of the hunger strike. Uh, initially, I was taken from the prison hospital and brought to Musgrave Park Hospital, where there was a, a secure wing, and placed in the ward with three other hunger strikers, Pat McGeown, Bernard Fox and Liam McCluskey. Uh, and I was there for the next month. Uh, in fact, uh, I was the first of the four of us to be sent back to the H-blocks again. Uh, when I arrived back in the H-blocks, uh, everyone had their own clothes uh, and they were being allowed out for exercise uh, and, and that was the first time that any of us who had been on the protest had got fresh air in the whole time uh, the, the, the protest had gone on. Um, uh, even though I was back in the H-blocks I was still quite weak. I remember in the prison yard the first time I tried to run my legs were just like rubber uh, and I almost fell over. Uh, so recovery was a gradual process uh, and took, I would say, many months to get back to uh, any sort of real normality. But the conditions obviously had become much more relaxed, uh, but we hadn't got all our demands. We had our own clothes and that gave us a, a launching pad to set in motion uh, a, a new type of struggle within the prison to secure the rest of the demands. I think we were, uh, it was a period I would say uh, of low morale. Remember we had only recently lost uh, 10, 10 uh, comrades uh, and, and, and not just any sort of comrades, those were the men who were the leaders within the prison uh, and, and we had lost them. And there was a sense that we hadn't achieved everything that they had died for. But having said that, there was an absolute determination that we weren't going to accept any level of criminalisation uh, and that we were going to push forward and secure all the demands that the 10 lads died for. So the next big step was segregation uh, and we set about uh, a plan to create conflict within the prison and bring the prison regime into conflict with loyalists. Because one of the things we learnt from the hunger strike was that when we ended up headbutting or in direct confrontation with the Brits, by and large, we didn't win. So we decided to be clever about it this time and leave that confrontation to the British and the loyalists. Uh, uh, and that's what we did. We created a, a conflict situation within the prison. Uh, the loyalists then ended up on protest as a result of our actions. Uh, and then the British moved quite speedily to resolve the issue of segregation. So we had segregation. We had our own clothes. We still had to do prison work. But in 1983, we had the biggest escape 
from Long Cash when 38 men escaped and one of the biggest uh, prison escapes in Europe since the Second World War. And the day after that escape, all prison work was stopped. Uh, so we had achieved our own closed segregation and an end to prison work. Now, the prison administration, especially in the aftermath of the escape, tried to impose strict control, and we resisted that. And within a couple of years, uh, the prison regime, the prison administration, had effectively thrown in the towel. Uh, and uh, we went back to a system where the spokespeople, our command structures within the prison, were being recognised, not just uh, at a local level by the prison administration, but also at a higher level in the NIO. So within the space of four or five years of the end of the hunger strike, all the demands had been achieved. Uh, I spent a total of around 18 and a half years in prison. Uh, obviously, the early stages of that were very difficult uh, and, and ver very much a conflict situation. Uh, but as time went on, the situation uh, became a lot easier. We were able to focus our attention on education and there was a culture among Republican prisoners of getting involved in, in education uh, and not just not because we wanted to use it to get jobs or anything when we were released, although I'm sure many people did that, but it was about using our time constructively because we, understand, we understood that the British government wanted to break us, uh, but we wanted to politicise ourselves, we wanted to educate ourselves. And many, many Republican prisoners uh, became involved in full-time education, maybe starting off doing GCSEs and then A-levels and moving on to do degrees. I myself did a degree in uh, philosophy and politics uh, while I was in prison, and many other prisoners did exactly the same. Uh, and I suppose the ultimate recognition that we were political prisoners came with the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, when all political prisoners were released, and that was when I myself was released. Had it not been for the Good Friday Agreement, I would have been in prison for a further 10 years. Uh, so, um, started off bad, uh, it got better uh, and improved considerably. Uh, upon my release, uh, I got married, I had a son, uh, I had my own business, I then worked with the Republican Ex-Prisoners Organisation uh, and when Jerry Adams, our party leader, went to the South to contest elections, I was co-opted to the local assembly in his place. Uh, I was re-elected in my own right shortly after that and have since been re-elected again in the most recent assembly election. Today I look back with pride uh, on what took place 35 years ago. Uh, not just the fact that I was personally involved in the hunger strike and that I am in some small way associated with the men who died, but I also believe it is the single most uh, significant political event of the last 50 years. Uh, I believe the seeds of the peace process were sown in the hunger strikes of 1981. Uh, you know, what people maybe don't know or don't remember is that Republicans didn't contest elections prior to 1991. But Bobby Sands' uh, election as an MP while he was on hunger strike in 1981 uh, convinced many Republicans who were sceptical about moving into electoral politics that another front of struggle could be opened there. And after Bobby's death, when Sinn Féin began to contest elections and go from strength to strength, it completely demolished the British strategy of trying to isolate and marginalise Republicans. In fact, it had the opposite effect. The criminalisation process had the opposite effect of marginalising and isolating and defeating Republicans. Uh, it meant Republicans... Uh, could increase their support and build support and they did that through elections. And of course the British military establishment had long recognised that they couldn't defeat the IRA. Uh, of course the political establishment was some way behind that. But no doubt the events of 1981 uh, and the outworkings of 1981 with the success of Sinn Féin convinced people within the British political establishment 
that this was a war they couldn't win and therefore needed to go on to negotiation. And that's where I believe, back with the hunger strike and Bobby's election in 1981, was how that all happened. And, you know, I've been involved in this struggle for a very long time. I joined the FENA in 1972 and later uh, the IRA. And all of those things I did to try and bring about change in this country. Uh, and that was what our struggle was all about, whether it was uh, armed actions on the street, whether it was protests in the prison, or hunger striking, or since then, since my release, and becoming a member of the Assembly here. My whole aim and the aim of our movement is to bring about change. I'm still doing what I was doing back in 1972, only by different methods.